Hello and welcome back to our High Fleet playthrough, where things are getting hectic, but we're having a lot of fun, even if it's tense and scary. Um, just before we kick off, I just want to thank Tortuga Power for uh, mentioning me and featuring me in one of his recent videos. I really appreciate that. I can't believe someone's been watching my gameplay and been inspired to change theirs off it. That's awesome. Uh, we keep attention to the rest of your videos and see how it goes. And also, thank you for everyone who's been uh, just watching and commenting. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a while since I made YouTube videos, and it's nice to see the community is still so fantastic. Um, if you remember last time, like I mentioned before, we had a big fight at Karkamesh. It's uh, turned out okay because we We've got a trade fleet out of it, but the lightning is really badly injured. Um, you'll see that it has taken a lot of damage. It's missing three engines, which is a big expense to replace. Um, we also failed to get a hidden city, which is a little bit tricky, and I'm a bit frustrated at that, but we're going to have to deal with it and maybe look for it after we've dealt with the strike group that we're hopefully baiting in. Um, there's also something I need to address relating to Elint, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and I also just want to mention that I'm doing post-commentary on this video, so things should be a bit calmer. Um, I might swap from this format to doing live commentary while I'm playing, post-commentary on the games, on the actual combat, but we'll see. Let's not forget, we've got Granite, the strike group in the northeast. We've got Varyag, the strike group in the northwest. Varyag is a name I'm scared of. If you've played the game, you'll know what I mean. If you don't, don't worry, you'll find out. Renegade is also up here. They're an aircraft carrier group. We don't want to run afoul of them. At the moment, I am not happy with our anti-air capabilities, and I don't think we have adequate AA to deal with a, like a, a massive airstrike, so we need to watch out for that. At the moment, they are too far away, hopefully, to be a problem, but once we deal with the strike group, we're going to have to ghost. Uh, again, just for those of you who may be joining us recently or haven't got the plan, we've raised the alarm. That red flag means that we, the enemy knows that we are here and we're going to pull them into this location. We're going to detect them with our passive sensors so they don't know that we've detected them and then we're going to hit them hard with strategic missile strikes, with strategic airstrikes coming out of the fleet that's in Ashkelon and we're hopefully going to wipe them off the face of the earth before they even know we're coming. If they somehow survive this, the plan is to get a lightning in there to try and duel the massive capital ships that they will be bringing to bear um, and, and finish them off in their damaged state so that we can loot them for money. But it's probably going to result in a situation where we don't make money on this attack, but taking out one of the five strike groups in the game is worth it. At least if we, t you know, we're, we can't afford to let all of them pass without looting them. There's too much good stuff there, but we can afford to lose one, and the, the first one is usually one that hasn't got too much stuff. There's still going to be a lot. So what we need to do now is get ourselves in a position where we're ready to stage this ambush. We've, we've sort of ticked the first box in that we've alerted the enemy. They're going to be slow. If you remember, Granite has a top speed of about 120 kilometers per hour. It's going to take them a little bit of time to get here. So we need to be in a position to hit them hard when they do. Uh, things we need to watch out for, the rooster's badly damaged. It's on low morale. We want to get that morale up to six if we can. We're not going to have time to do that, but that's where I want my morale to be sitting. Luckily, it's at rest 99%, so that's going to pop over to morale four very soon, but they're not going to get a lot of time to rest here. Um, we also need to be aware of where the Sevastopol is. The Sevastopol is currently trucking up to Ashkelon, which previously was a great place to put it because I thought it would be able to hop um, north to Karkamish to get um, some refits on it or over to a hidden city. It's now going to be too close to the front line. So I'm going to actually send it over to the western side of the map um, to Kushan, where it can get a little bit of fuel and jump up to Shebad to do another big refuel. Um, the, the Sevastopol is a gas guzzler. It just sucks down the fuel. We need to keep moving it to safe locations to refuel it. In the meantime, this fleet at Ashkelon also is going to need to get ready to position itself. Where it is currently, it can attack up to Karkamish with long-range weapons, with rockets and airstrikes. It can't project much further than that, and it has no fuel. So the first thing we're going to do is just get that fuel Fueled up. Once we've got Scott fueled, it'll be able to move into a position where it can support our lightning or even do a first strike that the lightning can finish off. So let's just get it enough fuel to, to move around a little bit if I want to land it in the desert and just relocate it. So that's them refueling. That's going to take a little bit of time, but not too long. Now, we have our fleet over here at Karkamish. We have work to do with them. There's actually a rescue order pending, I believe, or in the middle of a rescue, and there's a lot of money to be made off that fight. But we also have this flight over in this uh, fleet, sorry, over in Gizram, and they can continue to earn money for us. And potentially, if they get to Haran, maybe get some some more strategic missiles for us or other useful things that we can then use going forward to support our attack. So let's not forget about the fleet at Gizram with the Lone Badger. Um, just while I've got a second as well, there was a bug in the game last time that miscommunicated to me the range of my Elin scanner, and that is going to severely affect my gameplay for this section that I've recorded. Um, the problem is, as the game reported, my 
um, ELINT range as 750 kilometers when I clicked and unclicked on the module. It's actually 1,500, but I'm going to be assuming that it's 750 kilometers for this section because that's what the game told me in its statistics. So bear with me when I make a few little ELINT errors, which are going to be quite, honestly quite tense and interesting, but that's just something to bear in mind. I've been given the wrong information for the game. I knew it was 1,500 kilometers. I planned it off 1,500 kilometers. You saw me do it, and then I went and checked, and the game told me the wrong information. So that's a bit unfortunate. Anyway, let's, um, we might keep the rooster here because this is a repair pl place and there may be enough time to actually get the rooster fully repaired because this particular town, Karkamesh, has advanced repair. We want to get the um, Skylark uh, fueled up, however. So let's fly it in to Karkamesh. Um, we've got the Sylvester flying over to Kushan. Um, and yes, I just want to point it out, I do know about the compass tool. There is two tools here, the ruler and the compass, and the compass will let you draw a sphere. Uh, sorry, a circle. Um, I do know that it exists. So, for example, that's the what I my perceived range of my Elant on my my um, my my Skylark, which is actually double that range as I just mentioned, because it's one thousand five hundred kilometers, not seven fifty. Once I finish this recording session, I will fix that. Don't worry. Um, but I will be making some assumptions based on the range that will cause me some issues in this recording. Um, so that's the Skylark going into land at Karkamesh. We'll get it refueling. I think the first thing I'm capturing is the fuel. Um, no, let's say I grabbed something else. Maybe I got the, the uh, did I get the crew? I'm not sure what I grabbed first. I can't remember, but I should, I've got, so I've got a D80 Molot here, which is good to grab. I've got the fuel, I've got the ammo. I've got survivors to search for as well. Um, we've got time, I think, to get the Molot and then the survivors and then possibly the fuel, but it might be a bit tight. I might just sit in the menu to make sure that we get this. The Molot's good to grab because it's worth a lot of money and the 130 millimeter guns are good. Um, we'll grab the survivors next. Hopefully we've got enough money to grab the fuel tanks after that. Um, and then we can get landed and we can get repairing. Uh, meanwhile, we're refueling at Ashkelon, which is good. It's going to take a long time for our fleet to get to... Uh... Oh, I wanted to point out as well that your aircraft need to refuel as well when they return from a mission. And it does take a little bit of time before you can send them out again. Um, just having a look at our ranges here. Uh, I've got quite a lot of ammo left. The numbers next to our rockets and bombs, by the way, is how many full loads those ships have, not how many of that item we have. So we have 23 bomber loads of, of 250 kilogram bombs, not 23 250 kilogram bombs. And that's a big thing to be aware of. Um, we have a lot of bombing runs available to us because I've been picking up bombs every time I've got a little bit of money to build up that stockpile for when we get to this stage of the game. And I'll be continuing to do that as we go forward. Um, hopefully we can get a refresh on the Ashkelon's um, sensors as well, and maybe it's time we send out the Lone Badger on an attack. Um, there's a trade fleet, just checking that out, up here, um, Argon, no, Vulture, that's just coming into land at Cumdag, um, which is a great name. I, I love the names of some of the towns in this place. Uh, you might notice that we've got Imjur north of Gizram there as well. <laughs> um, we've got the crew rescue, so we're not getting another morale failure, which is great. Just enough time to grab that fuel, which is important, saves us a bit of money. Getting that trade fleet in our last flight, honestly, is a huge windfall. Um, I was starting to run a little bit low on cash and where I didn't have cash to continue the fight. Um, and now I'm just going to check out how far my missiles can actually extend to from where we are. I know I've got a range of roughly 1,500, so what I'm doing here is I'm just going to draw on a circle so I know what the missile range of my rockets is. I've given it a little bit extra because they do fly a little bit further, that's the detection range. Um, but you can see we've got quite a long way we can look there. Um, just having a look at our ships, we've got a bit of a bug here. Some of our ships are appearing as different things. So that Skylark appeared as a Vestipol. This Wasp is apparently showing up as, I think it's a Slogger, which is a, a light Corvette. But they are the correct ship when you're in the menu. Um, I don't know what's going on. Just looking at the Yars, uh, I'm talking about the KH-15 missiles because I didn't really spend a lot of time on them before. So the KH-15 missile is a radar, radar homing turbojet powered cruise missile. It travels its max range, which is 1,500. And then when it reaches to the, wherever you clicked on the map, it turns on its radar and will scan in a 90 degree cone for anything past it. So that red line is actually not the total limit of the rocket, but pretty much the limit. Um, the P version does the same thing, but with Elant. Um, so I'm just like I'm just confirming my ranges are right at about 1,500 kilometers, just to make sure that I know how far I can cover these missiles, um, because I want to know when I'm in safe launching distance that I'm not going to run out of fuel before my missile hits the target. That's the worst thing that can happen is to launch rockets at a target and either overshoot because you haven't calculated properly, or have the rockets fall out of the sky because you haven't given them enough fuel. Um, there are other rockets in the game that are longer ranged and fly further, but so far we only have baby missiles, which are the KH-15s. 
that's a, with tons of fuel out of the flight at Carcamesh. It's a little bit of an awkward zoom in, which I always have problems with uh, when I'm trying to zoom in, especially on rescue orders. We've got the choice of getting an AK-100 or a Palash, but the Palash has a um, threat on it, so we'll get the AK-100. That's a decent little gun. We're almost at um, Haran here, and look, I've made a mistake, and I'm going to point that out before we start. We're still in an alarm race. If you look in the top right-hand corner, that means that when my lightning hits Haran, it's going to raise an alarm there, and that's going to cause problems for us because now the AI will have two different locations marked on its map as enemy um, activity, which is a problem. But I haven't caught that, and it's going to be a mistake that I make, and we're just going to have to deal with that. Um, I'm really pushing for this attack. <laughs> I wish the rooster was one of those. Um, uh, that ship has... Does it actually have any guns, that ship? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what ship that is. I can't recognize it. Oh, it's got the it's got a double-barreled 130mm. Uh, this is the rooster coming in for a landing. It only has three engines. It usually has five. Um, and because it doesn't have its normal down... It normally has two static downward-facing thrusters in the middle that aren't there. It's actually coming in at a very awkward angle. My hope is that if I can land it, I can get it repaired before we need to get it out of here. And there is a 373% repair bonus landing bay below us. So we just have to bring it in as carefully as we can. If we get it on the ground, then we can get it repaired. We'll just see how that goes. It's a bit tricky because the... Um, Ship still has a pretty good thrust to weight ratio because it's lost so much weight um, and it's very tricky to land and I think my goal here is just actually just going to get it on the ground even if I don't get it on the landing gear um, without hitting it down too hard because if you slam it down you do even more damage to it. I don't lose another engine. So we'll just bring it down as gently as we can and because we touch the wall we actually get the credit ooh, of the above landing bay as well giving us a total of 483% repair speed bonus um, which is a huge huge advantage and if you check here when i come in to repair the rooster uh you'll see oh yeah i'm landing the skylark as well and the reason i'm landing the skylark is i'm not certain if the repair speed bonuses stack or not but i'm willing to land the skylark just to find out and this is your first look at the skylark in action and just because i'm really salty about it i will point out that that elink dome on the top is the max range 100 1500 kilometer one not the 750 cheap one and i'm really frustrated about my whole next hour of gameplay being based on me having a 750 kilometer elink speed uh, range rather than 1,500. And this is why you check again and again what components you have on your ships and you confirm them because um, I made an assumption and that assumption made an ass out of you and me. Oh, that's a terrible joke. All right, so uh, there's some interesting stuff available here. Lots of engines. Um, NK-25s are great. Um, but let's get the... Uh, the rooster repaired. And look at that. It's going to take 2.1 hours to repair this ship. Now, those of you who've played this game extensively, like me, who have probably focused on a more brawl heavy strategy at the beginning of the game, would have looked at the damage on the rooster and just been like, now you'll see that I'm getting the 483% speed bonus, but even without that bonus, this would have taken 4.3 hours to repair. Some of the ships in this game will take days to repair from damage like that, but I can get the rooster back up and running so quickly that it, it I can actually afford to not really afford, but I can recover from heavy damage at that so quickly because I'm not dealing with expensive components and armor. I'm just getting some ammo here. We've got some more aircraft rockets, getting some 130 millimeter proximity fuse. Um, we've got no 130 armor piercing, unfortunately, which is something I'm looking for. I uh, really want to find that 300 millimeter gun if it exists. Um, and that means the rooster's going to be back up in, a in action in two and a bit hours, which is crazy. Like, it's actually crazy that it's going to be available that quickly. Rest is also shooting up as well because these guys are Royal Guard, so they're going to get the morale up quite quickly. Um, the other Lightning's about to hit the town up north, so we're just about to run into another fight. Um, I still... I've just realized now that I'm coming in on a silent strike alarm, so they've marked my position. That other red flag is them marking my position, and I'm going, oh no, what have I done? So we're dealing with another Sarma. We're dealing with two Intrepids. I made a post in one of the forums I'm talking about this game and about how to fight Sarmas and Intrepids, but I'll talk about it really quickly now as well. The Sarma is a very heavily armored Corvette, but because it is a Corvette, it has to make sacrifices in its design to fit everything it's got into a small chassis. And it does that by putting all of those fuel tanks in the middle of its body and then not armoring the lower portion of itself. So that lower section that has the module with, a, with the wings on it, that's the bridge, and below that the gun, there's no armor there. And shots from below that come up from directly below will either hit the bridge hit that gun or detonate the fuel tanks, taking it out really, really quickly. The Intrepid is in a similar boat. It's got lots of fuel tanks at the bottom. So attacking the Intrepid from below, there's no armor there 
or attacking from above and coming in and hitting the bridge, both of those strategies will take these ships out really, really quickly. And you'll see in this fight that I really monopolize on the fact that these ships are weak from attacks from below or attacks from atop, the top and below. Um, and this is how you can really mitigate um, having a lighter ship and make it last longer. I'm actually considering not taking the HE ammo for this fight, but what I do is I sw take the HE ammo and then switch straight over so I take the AP ammo and switch straight over to HE so that I don't need to worry. Like, I've got it in my pocket if I need it. So this is the Ballistic, which is the unarmored ship. It's dead already. Same problem. It had fuel tanks at the bottom. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see all the fuel tanks. All those blue um, spherical objects or, or lozenge-shaped objects are fuel tanks. Um, I've already destroyed one. The second two are on fire. And this is how you fight these ships. Uh, the Intrepid is in the same boat. It has lots of fuel tanks below. And I can just fire up now. It wasn't the greatest bit of shooting, but now I've almost broken through the, the chassis to the fuel tanks. One of the fuel tanks is damaged. Now one is, is be exploded. Take a couple of hits, that's fine. Coming back on the Sarma, I'm not even gonna try and fire it from above. I just wanna get below it. Struggling to get below it, it's descending too. So we'll take a couple of shots at the cockpit using armor piercing ammo. It has um, a little bit of armor on top. We just got caught fire. Getting hit by 130 is pretty bad. We actually took a really big hit there. Um, we lost the whole side of the ship, and we better hit take a bit from another missile. That's another hit, big hit, and we're down to one gun. Um, honestly, the damage we've taken is pretty catastrophic, so I'm just going to restart and try again. There's nothing wrong with restarting fights in this game. It's a mechanic that's built in for a purpose. You are the underdog, but you just can't do it too many times. So I'm down to four morale. I really need to win on this one. My... I'm boosting here to try and get these rockets to hit the ballistic, but the Intrepid doesn't work. Thankfully, they shoot them down for me. Um, we get in underneath the Sarma and just fire up straight underneath it, trying to hit that um, that bridge section. I've destroyed the bottom gun. I've got some fuel tanks on fire. I'm going to have to dodge the rockets from the ballistic. Got a rocket coming in. We dodge that. The ship shoots it down for us and shoots down its second rocket for us, which is fantastic. I love it when the enemy helped me out. Um, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see how much damage the Sarma has taken to its undercarriage. A couple more shots, and that's the bridge destroyed. Sorry, I didn't mean to snap my fingers next to the microphone. Um, and that's it dead. And that's how you deal with it. So we're going to do the same thing on the Intrepid. Uh, trying to get below it. Got to watch out for the ballistics from rockets. They do a lot of damage if they hit you. Got to watch out for that 130mm. We all know how good the 130mm is. Going to take a couple of shots from the top. You can see on the diagram in the bottom right, it has some angled armor to try and block shots coming in from a 45 degree angle. But the AP will break through those. And that's one shot got through, hit the ammo container, and detonated the entire ship. That's why AP ammo is great. The ballistic, I can just take my time with. Its rockets are easy to avoid when you're not under pressure from any other ships, and it has no armor, basically. It's a little armored on the side, but not enough that I'm really worried. So we'll just fire at that for a little bit. Uh, bridges at the top as well, so enough shots on top will usually destroy the bridge. Just watch out for that rocket. That's not something I want to get hit by. Um, he's on fire right now, which is great. Fire damage is lethal. Uh, the rocket launcher that he's got is a 220 millimeter rocket launcher. That's the one that takes those 220 meter incendiary rockets, not the 300s, but the 200s, the 220s. It's um, it's not a gun I've had a lot of success with. On paper, it looks really, really good, but you've seen how it fires in those staggered missile blocks. It also needs four ammunition pods in your ship, uh, which is a lot of space to take up. So you end up with, a if you try and put it in a small ship, you end up with a ship like, like the Ballistic that is mostly ammunition. Um, took a bad hit there. We're running a bit low on fuel. I need to finish this fight up. Um, I'm just going to start trying to bully this guy. I'm playing it very safe because I don't want to take too much damage and it's making the game fight take too long. He's lost uh, an engine on the top, right? He's not that far away from just dying. And there we go. Got a fuel tank and he blew up. Um, and that's a lot of experience for the lightning again. So we'll just continue and see what we got. So the only badger levels up to level 6. From these choices, Veteran Gunner gives us a reload speed increase um, in combat, and that's probably the most useful one. Veteran Engineer is cruising range, uh, Veteran Pound is, is maneuverable speed, but the recharge is best. Um, got some stuff to pick up as well. Got a, two D80 Mollets available to us there, an A220, which is the rocket launcher, it's worth a lot of money. Um, no survivors to worry about, so we'll probably grab the Mollet, and we'll probably get the other Mollet and get the A220 if we can. But that's not bad. The problem is, is we've alerted the enemy to our presence, and that's not good. Now I'm worried about um, the Sevastopol because the Sevastopol is heading up to the northwest and now the enemy know that we're in the northwest. So bringing it up there is not a good idea. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop it where it is and land it in the desert. And it's not moving. It's not burning fuel. I can leave it there. It's not going to be revealed unless somebody comes nearby and I can make a decision on what I'm doing. Um, I need to pay attention to what's going on here. I need to pay attention to my other ship. 
I shouldn't have attacked while the alarm was raised, which has reset the alarm as well. I'm going to grab the A220. I might be able to get the D80 Molot as well. There's a lot of money available on the ground there. That's 1,200 credits on its own. It's more money. That's a huge chunk of money. Um, actually, no, it's 12,000 credits because each one's fourth worth 4,000. So it's more money than I currently have in the bank just lying on the desert floor there. Uh, and again, salvage game is important. Okay, we've got a repair job finished up, a rescue job finished up in Haran. Let's grab the other Molot and we managed to get all of those guns. That's such a great result for that attack. Um, we're up to 0 0.4 hours left to repair. I'm going to send my, okay. Whew, I'm getting excited because I know what's coming next. This is a big, important change in the game. We've picked up an active radar signal in one of our fleets on Eland. Now, because I've got my fleet at Karkamish selected when that alert came up, and I'm expecting a fleet to attack me in Karkamish, I have assumed that I have picked up the Eland from Karkamish. And I now believe that within 750 kilometers of Karkamish is an enemy strike fleet. Because remember, I checked that module last time and I believed that this this ship has a Eland detection radius of one of 750 kilometers, not 1,500 kilometers. So I think they're on top of me and I'm panicking a little bit because I did not expect them to get to me so quickly. If you check the screen though, you'll see that it is actually the fleet at Haran that has picked up an Elint signature, not the fleet at Karkamish. And I will understand that in a second. Just to explain Elint very quickly, the inner bar of sort of lit up and unlit bars is the range from your scanner to the target that is, ra that is scanning you, that is sweeping you. So at the moment they're at max range and each, each one of those lights up, they get closer. The outer circle is the bearing from your position that you're detecting the radar sweeps from. Now, the other thing that I do when I detect this is I swing around my infrared scanner to face the same bearing as the Elint scanner. And if I keep my eye on that, I might be able to spot incoming missiles before they hit me. But honestly, I usually have so much going on that I miss it, but it's important to do that. Now, at the moment, I still think that Karkamish is under attack and I'm panicking really badly because I'm not ready to defend this attack. So again, I'm just checking how far away 750 kilometers. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm actually looking at the range of the infrared scanner, which is roughly 400 kilometers. It's actually less on the Skylark because, um, oh no, I'm looking at the Eland range, but the IR scanner doesn't have quite max range because it's uh, not mounted very well and it's slightly obscured by structure. But 750 kilometers is about that far. So I'm thinking I've, I've gone up 60 degrees. They could be on this bearing here. They could be heading down to ACTAC. So my plan at this point is to mark that they are here on the map and then keep an eye on the bearing and see if the bearing changes and then I'll know if they're heading down to Aktag or crossing the desert to mean Karkamesh. I still haven't realized it's the other fleet <laughs> that is getting picking up this um, this this uh, signal. So yeah, you've got you've got to watch out for that. Now I'm like, why does the game keep telling me I'm selecting this Skylark up here? And then it twigs for me. Because I select over to the Karkamesh fleet and go, oh, it's not happening. And then I realize it's the fleet at Haran. And that's a big problem because that means that the Varyag strike group that we detected at Masada is going to be heading down towards Haram to deal, sorry, Haran, to deal with the Lone Badger and the Skylark that are there. That means I can't afford to repair the Lone Badger here because they're already on the way. And like I said, I think that they're 750 kilometers away because I've been misled by the game. And I believe that they are right on top of me because the town is a thousand kilometers away. So they must be about here. They must be already on the way. Like, I think that an attack is imminent. And I don't, I know for a fact that the rooster on its own, unsupported, cannot take a strike group. And my strategic options to help out are on the other side of the map. So my only option here is to dip out play cat and mouse and run away and not engage the strike group because if I take them on front on, I'm gonna lose these two ships. The good news is, is the Skylark and the Lightning together are more than fast enough to outrun the big lumbering cruise, uh, capital ships that are in a strike group. So now I need to work out where to take them. I'm thinking, hmm, if I fly down to Nahor, I get some fuel and then we'll dip over to Kushan and we will fully repair ourselves. Looking over on the other side of the map, Sevastopol definitely is not going to Kushan anymore. There's a strike group over there. So I'm going to fly them over to Suva, fuel them up over there, and then maybe take them either up to Timnath Sera or over to Zartana, or hopefully, fingers crossed, up to a hidden city that I've detected when I've got time to look for it. Uh, I'm a bit frustrated now because I know there's a strike group heading to Haran. I didn't want to attract a strike group to Haran. This is my fault for attacking Haran while the silent strike alarm is on. This means that they're not going to be in a position 
to I'm, I'm really worried that another strike group basically is heading to Haran as well and they're not heading down to Karkamish and I need them to head to Karkamish because I need to ambush them so I order my I get my the D80 Molot um, so I've managed to pick up all of the weapons from that that loot and I'm flying away and basically what I want to happen is I want this Elan signal to go away and that means I've left them behind now you and me viewer we know that they're actually 1,500 kilometers away they're still sitting in Masada they've just taken off but because I had the incorrect information, and this game is all about information, I thought they were a lot closer than they were. And you're going to see that play into the rest of this episode, and it will be a little bit frustrating, but it's actually really interesting as well to see how you deal with these kind of things. Now, the Sylvester Paul is telling me that it hasn't had enough fuel to get to Suva. I haven't noticed that yet, but don't worry, I notice it before it becomes a problem. Now I'm going to go back to what I was doing before that has happened, which is sending the Skylark north to try and pick up the other strike group and find out where they are. Um, I make a slight mistake here and that I order the Skylark straight north to Dabao, which is actually a main trade route. You don't ever want to put your listing ships on a trade route just in case they run into something you don't know it's there, like a trade fleet that flies past and sees them out the window. Always put them off by a couple of hundred kilometers so they don't get picked up. But that's, it's not a huge issue here. Um, let's just see how this plays out. So I'm now sitting looking at the Elint um, scanner in the top of the screen there for the Skylark and now I'm correcting my mistake and I'm just flying them a little bit off so they're in between the routes to Aktag and Karkamish from Tabao so they can detect anyone coming from those directions. Meanwhile my other fleet has just arrived at uh, the city on, on the left hand side of the map which is great they can repair there. Um, we'll just get these guys to land in the desert and I'm just going to mark out a 750 kilometer. Again, I'm going to harp on about it because I think my bubble is a lot smaller than it is. And I'm like, oh, I need to get my ships back to a repair yard. And I need to repair them up to, I need to replace the module on them to a 1,500 module. It's a really rare module. Where am I going to find it? No, the Skylark comes with the best module. <laughs> it's fine. But we'll use the compass tool, which I knew about in the last episode. I just forgot to use because I was panicking out to 1,500, uh, well, up to 750 kilometers. But if you imagine double that circle, that's the actual Eland range on this transport. But I thought I've done the best thing here. I've put it in a position where if a fleet is taking off from Tabal, I'll detect it. Um, and if a fleet is coming along any of the route, routes south of Tabal or from Kema down to Karkamesh, I'll pick them up as well. And I should get enough early warning to do something about any incoming targets. There's just a lot going on, and I, I know I'm making a few mistakes, and I kind of advertise this playthrough as being, you know, above average, but look, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. I'm in lockdown. It's tough right now. Uh, this is how I'm unwinding, and um, honestly, giving the commentary has been distracting me a bit, but hopefully this new post-commentary works really well. Just going to upfuel my fleet at Ashkel a little bit, because I want to fly them up to Aktag, um, and if they're in Aktag, I just want them enough fuel to get out of there if they have to. We'll wait for that to happen. Just notice that the Sevastopol now has no fuel, so we'll just like it, it's landing Goshen. The fuel reporting isn't 100% accurate, I notice. So sometimes a ship will say it can get somewhere, then you order it there and it can't. Um, I notice that there are ships for sale here. There is a Wasp, which would be great to pick up, but I don't want to spend the money on it. Um, so I don't want to grab any of those ships. We'll just get enough fuel to get to Goshen, which is where we're going to repair the uh, Lone Badger. We're not going to repair in Nahor because the, the it's taken a little bit too much damage and I want to get it fully repaired quickly. So we're going to fly it to Kushan. I'm also in the back of my mind bringing it over to the east, A, to avoid the strike fleet in the north, but also so that it is in range to support the rooster should we need it in an extended fight and I can bring them together into one strike fleet and have two assault ships in that strike fleet rather than just one assault ship. Um, so that's kind of ticking over in the back of my head as well. Looking at the map, Aktag seems like the perfect location to position um, Aktag or somewhere in between Ashkel and Aktag seems like the perfect position to land my strike fleet so that they can support everybody to the north. Um, and the the advantage of putting them in the desert is that they can land there and launch airstrikes all day long and not worry about anyone in the city reporting their presence. Um, but the downside to that is I can't refit my ships in the desert, which means I can't reload my strategic missiles. You need to be landed in a town to refit strategic missiles, and it actually takes a re like a repair action to do that. But my plan here is I'm going to send the um, lightning, the rooster, out to Aktag, which has already repaired itself. And I'm going to do that for one reason, and that is to raise the alarm again. Um, I'm just going to make more noise in this region. And I'm, like, I don't know why it's renamed itself to Lightning Upgun. It's because I named it incorrectly and I will fix that. But I'm trying to make more noise to convince the the enemy to head over this way. I'm kind of like, no, hey, look over here. No, no, really, look over here. Come and get me. Um, because I made the mistake of attacking during a silent strike alarm over on the other side of the map. So we'll just let them fly over. It's going to take an hour for them to fly there. Uh, the Ashkelon fleet is now heading out to the desert as well. 
because the silent strike alarm is still going off, I'll be able to hit this town with the lightning and um, mark my and just alert the enemy again that we're here. And it's kind of kind of doubled down on that uh, because they're going to be like, "Oh, you really are here. You know, you, you've hit us two, two towns." Um, if you remember, I hit this town a long time ago. There's a Fennec here, which is kind of cool. I'm, I'm Honestly, if I had the money and I wasn't under pressure, I might pick that up to just uh, escort the Sevastopol. I could get a lot of fuel here. I grab enough fuel to get to Zartana fuel storage on the far right of the map there on the east, just as that's, that's like a backup location to head to, and I can get a big refuel there as well. It's a little bit frustrating because I want to be heading north, and that's heading east. I'm, you know, heading... Okay, hold that thought. This is where things get serious. The Skylark north of Karkamesh has just detected a radar sweep coming at it from a northerly direction. Again, I believe the max range is 750. I'll stop, I'll stop hopping on about that, but just remember that for all this, it's actually 1,500. So if you look at the Elant scanner, I've got a max range ping at, the, at bearing zero. So I've got my ruler up at zero degrees and I've marked it on my map and I'm like, that's a really weird location for a strike fleet to be because generally, generally, they fly along the trade lines. So I'm wondering if something has happened and they've broken off to head north. I'm putting the compass down because I'm giving myself a roughly 100 kilometers margin of error on the scan. So I think either somewhere in this bubble. It's actually probably a little bit bigger than that, the margin of error, but I'd like to put a circle down about 100 kilometers around my Elant points to give myself a little wiggle room to be like, look, they're somewhere in here. They're not bang on the point because it's really easy to miscommunicate to yourself that you think they're in this exact position. So I'm like... Okay, they're heading south by the looks of things. So they've, they've just come into range, right? I've just picked them up because the Skylark has been sitting in the desert. You can see there for 1.8 hours and it's not picked anything up. And then suddenly it's picked them up. Now what's probably happened is this fleet is flying down from the north um, and it's just entered the out, south side of my Elant bubble heading down to Karkamish. But because I think it's a 750, I'm like, what's this? what route are they taking here to get here? I mean, I know they're there and I know it's a strike fleet because they're the only ones that use radar, but... Uh, I'm not sure what's happening. Now, just in terms of the Skylark sitting in the desert there, every time the enemy fleet scans their radar, sweeps their radar around, they will pass over the Skylark. But because the Skylark is landed, and it has a very, it has a reasonably small, you can make the ship better, it has a small radar profile, it's usually, fingers crossed, in inverted commas, not going to be picked up by the radar because it's so small, um, and it can sit there and, and just report back on them like an intel ship, uh, like a counter, counter electronic warfare ship for quite a while without me needing to worry about it. So we're dealing with two Intrepids in this fight. Um, that's, that's a lot of 130mm ammo, but the, the good news is, is they've got the same weaknesses that the Intrepid had in the last fight. I've already set the engines on that one, on the fuel tanks on that one on fire. As long as we get below them and shoot up, we should be able to take them out. Let's just do some dodging. You've got to listen out for that that tick, 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 tick noise. Um, that's your warning that they are about to kill you, basically. That's when you start dodging. Um, I'm just trying to get them to shoot each other here, which is why I pull up really fast, but it's not, didn't time it quite well. Getting it, sitting in the middle of three enemies is quite dangerous, but it's also great for getting them to shoot each other. Um, and you can get a lot of friendly fire damage. I imagine you get a couple of hits from the 57 millimeter there. And every extra shot that they could do on their teammates for you is just a bonus. I decided to take this Navarin out because it's not particularly well armored. It's lost engines. I like that upside down missile fire um, that they managed to get off there. Managed to evade that missile very quickly. Um, take a couple of 130mm hits, which is a bit frustrating, but um, the rooster is a is a tough girl. Let's just get this other guy. I'm trying to get that cockpit hit. Um, he caught fire a while ago and just got taken out. Take a couple of big hits there. Got to dodge this missile, which we managed to do very handily. We had inches to spare on that dodge. Some really nice shots there up into that unarmored... Uh, yeah. That's why hitting the fuel tanks is great, because when you finally hit them, the thing just goes pop. Um, so we just got this one. This one is completely unscathed so far. Um, you'll notice that I can actually track their fuel as well. He's down to 50 fuel. Um, and enemies can run out of fuel and just drop out of the sky as well. And that's another reason you can shoot at the fuel tanks. If you hit them with incendiary ammo, which is something I've not really used, wow, big ad explosion there from the fuel tanks. Uh, you, you can actually just destroy their fuel, and either the fuel will explode and destroy the ship, or they run out of fuel and crash. And there are some designs that are 
horrendously fuel inefficient and taking the fuel out is a valid tactic. But you'll hear most people, and you'll hear me really, mostly talk about how great AP ammo is because it is the best ammo. Uh, but the other ammos are all very valid as well, including the laser guided. So the laser guided lets you make some really good position shots. I will show it off eventually. But now that I'm focusing a lot more on hitting these ships in the right locations, you can see I'm winning these fights in a much more handy manner. No more um, very tense fights over a Gargamesh, please. Now, here's something weird that happens. The Lonely Badger gets a level up. I have no idea why. Because when I select something, a promotion... Oh, somebody asked me if the crew gets anything apart from these perks when they level up. No, they just get the perks. But what you can do is take a ship that has a lot of perks, rebuild it, and suddenly a really big ship has crazy perks. Um, like increased maneuverability or instantly loading guns, and you have like 20 um, guns on your ship. It's a bit crazy. So now the Lightning, which is the Rooster, the Lightning Up Gun is the Rooster, but now it's got to level up. So I don't know what happened there. I've literally never seen that bug before, but there we go. Maybe they just really enjoyed listening to it on the radio. Um, we're going to have to search for survivors. I can't afford any morale hits on this ship. Um, but now Actag is ours. And the other thing is, is they made some noise at Actag, um, but the enemy know, you know, the enemy just has more reasons to head in this direction, which is great. Uh, really what we're going to be mostly doing is taking, keeping an eye on this alert box and just watching how close they get. So that's what we're, we need to pay attention to. Um, now, now that we've taken act tag, we're in a position to set up our ambush. So we're probably going to leave it here for this video. Um, the next video is going to be us actually luring in the strike group, which we know is in the way, um, affecting a, a first strike on them with aircraft and strategic missiles, and then finishing them off if needed with a light ship. Now, I know it's going to be a little bit frustrating that I have the wrong ranges here, but we make it work. I promise it's going to be nice and tense and it's going to be fun. Thank you so much for watching these videos. Um, I really enjoy making them. I'm glad people are enjoying them. If you've got any comments, I'd love to read them. And thanks again to Tochuga Power for mentioning me. I can't believe you did that. Um, and I hope you enjoy the next video where I engage the strike fleet because I've already done it and I know what happens and it's mad. Catch you in the next video.